Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture, Lost Chicagoland Department Stores, by author, historian, and exhibit collaborative curator, Leslie Goddard. My name is, oh, give her a round of applause, absolutely. My name is Jess Wandersey. I'm the Supervisor of Education Services at the museum. By show of hands, who has already seen the exhibition? Excellent. For those of you who haven't, we invite you to go and see it at the museum. It will be open until January the 28th of next year, so you have plenty of time. I would not suggest all going rushing over today, but if a couple of you want to make it, I think it would be great. Our exhibitions and programs like this would not be possible without the support of the Elmhurst Heritage Foundation. It's our nonprofit fundraising arm of the Elmhurst History Museum. If you're a member or a board member of the foundation, please raise your hand and be recognized. If you're interested in becoming a member, please see me after today's lecture. I also want to take a moment to thank all of the businesses and organizations who sponsored this exhibit, Feezy Roofing, Lakeside Bank, Community Bank of Elmhurst, Bricksmore Elmhurst Crossing, Rotary Club of Elmhurst, and Storino, Romello, and Durkin Attorneys at Law. While many of the programs have sold out for this exhibition, including this one today, we have a couple coming up that do have availability. On November 18th, we are hosting a gift wrapping workshop with our um, Hannah Sundwell, who's our gift wrap boss out of Chicago. And on December 2nd, we are partnering with Brewpoint Craft Elmhurst for a SIP local event. Participants can listen to holiday music from Old Town School of Folk Music, have a free coffee on the museum, and listen to a short lecture from former director of windows and marketing events for Marshall Fields, Amy Meadows. Both events are available for registration on Eventbrite through our website. And now, without further ado, please welcome the wonderful Leslie Goddard. Thanks. I have to tell you how I got started on this whole project. Back in 2011, I wrote a book about uh, Marshall Fields. My grandfather worked at Marshall Fields for many years. I actually found his 25-year silver, do you remember when people got silver plates for, you know, 25 years? Um, and I was looking for a good book on Fields. And there wasn't really a good photograph history of Marshall Fields. So that came out in 2011. And when it did, someone sort of jokingly said to me, is your next book going to be about Goldblatt's? And then someone started reminiscing with me about how Goldblatt's used to have those great pet departments, like tons of people got little turtles from Goldblatt's, and they had great cheesecake and root beer dispensers. And then someone was reminiscing about the grocery stores in Sears. Do you remember when Sears had those Hillman's grocery stores? The more memories I heard, the more I thought, you know, Chicago did not have just one great department store. Chicago had a lot of them. In fact, I would go so far as to say Chicago in some ways invented some of the most distinctive things about modern department stores. So that is what led to my pandemic lockdown project, which was the book, Lost Chicago Department Stores, and then opening up at the Elmhurst History Museum through January 28th, Lost Chicagoland Department Stores. So what I want to do today is tell you some of the stories and show some images from this research, but I want to use them to explore this really interesting question of how, how and why Chicagoland was so innovative in department store history. However, I am not going to start at the beginning. I want to start in 1947. That is the year that the Chicago Tribune called State Street the world's greatest shopping center. It said that the 10 blocks of State Street going south from Rand Randolph was the single most concentrated retail shopping area in the world. You could buy anything on State Street, they said, from a needle to an airplane. And it was true, actually, Marshall Fields and Mandel Brothers both sold airplanes at one point. Like if you're out on your lunch break and you just need to pick up an airplane, you could do it. 
Now, there were a lot of stores on State Street in 1947, but really at the heart of them, and you can see a closer image of this, uh, this is just to give you a rough overview, there were actually seven great department stores on State Street in 1947, if we include the Boston store, which closed in 1948. But when you think about it, this is a phenomenal concentration of department stores in a very small geographical region. And they were fierce competitors for shoppers' attention, although they didn't really have to seek out shoppers because shopping on State Street was so dense. So what I want to do is look at these big department stores. And by the way, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the big full-line department stores, the stores that sold everything. They sold clothing, they sold shoes, they sold furniture, appliances, you name it, airplanes, right? But let's start with the grand dame of them all. Let's start with Marshall Field and Company. Of all Chicago department stores, there was none as grand or beloved as Marshall Fields. In fact, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, one Chicago matron said, everything is gone except, thank goodness, Marshall Fields. <laughs> which is a remarkable legacy for a store that started out as a small dry goods business, opened in 1852 on the first great commercial district of Chicago, which was, of course, Lake Street. Believe it or not, we're looking here at an image of Lake Street in the very early days of the city. That was where the commercial district was located. And this particular dry goods business, and it's the business that you see that's about five stories tall here with the flag coming out of it, flags, was started by a guy by the name of, any guesses? Potter Palmer. Believe it or not, uh, you might know Potter Palmer better for a certain hotel that he began on State Street. But his first thing when he arrived in Chicago was to open up a dry goods business. And he used some very innovative principles, luxury surroundings, beautiful high quality goods, and returns for any reason, which was not standard practice at the time. The store evolved a lot over the decades. It eventually moved to State Street and evolved from P. Palmer Dry Goods into Marshall Field and Company. This is an image of the store in the 1890s. It's, by this point, the crown jewel of Chicago full-line department stores. In fact, I think this might be the most beautiful building Marshall Fields was ever in. Very European style architecture. And it even had gas light. Uh, and very early on, electric light. But it was not big enough. Chicago's population was growing so massively that they needed to expand. So starting in 1902 and ultimately completed in 1907, they put up a new building on State Street, which is the one that you see here. This might look a little familiar because the building is still there. This was enormous, 13 stories tall with three sub-basements, 50 elevators, and 12 entrances. The main entrance is where those columns are. Those columns, fun trivia for you, are said to be the second tallest granite columns in the world. If you go to Egypt, you can see bigger at the Temple of Karnak, but otherwise, these are the biggest. The grandness of this building, combined with Marshall Field's reputation for luxury and customer service, all spoke to Marshall Field's position atop the hierarchy of department stores. Uh, here's a closer look at those columns. Those columns, by the way, they're 48 feet, 9 inches tall. They are still there. We just usually never see them because you kind of need a distance to get perspective on them. But in addition to being very big, Marshall Fields was also quite beautiful. At the corners of Randolph and Washington are two clocks, two bronze clocks. Each one weighs in at seven and three quarters 
tons of cast bronze, hence that beautiful green patina. The face of each clock is 46 inches across. And my favorite bit of trivia, in Roman numerals, what is the letter four indicated by? IV, right? In, on the Marshall Fields clock, the four is indicated by I, 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 I. This is not unusual on Victorian era clocks, but it's one of those fun bits of trivia we often miss. Inside the store, the main aisle extended all the way from Randolph down to Washington. It had marble floors, hand-carved mahogany counters, and these magnificent light wells. This is a postcard view of the South Light Well with a Tiffany mosaic on that vaulted ceiling. Walking into Marshall Fields was almost like walking into a museum. They surrounded you with light and color and art. You ever wonder why they have the perfume counters right by the doors? Uh, because it blocks out any of the smells from the stores outside. Not to mention it's good um, <laughs> impulse shopping, right? But it wasn't just the quality and the luxury of the merchandise. Marshall Fields also had extensive customer services. This is the ladies' waiting room on the third floor, which was huge. They had newspapers from dozens of cities delivered every day. You might even remember at one point they had a wall of telephones with like telephone books from every major American city. You could order airplane or steamship tickets. You could buy theater tickets, leave a message for your friend. There was one couple who divorced, and the husband left his wife's alimony check at Marshall Field, so <laughs> he wouldn't have to talk to her. Elsewhere in the store, they had a beauty salon and a children's haircut place, a marionette theater for children. More than any other Chicago department store, Marshall Fields really pampered its customers. Marshall Fields customer service was legendary. And nothing more so than delivery. This is an 1897 image of the Marshall Fields delivery trucks lined up in Holden Court. That, do you remember the alley that went through the store for many, many years? They would deliver goods as far north as Waukegan and as far to the west as Elgin, Illinois, which was way out in the boonies in 1897. Do you remember those green trucks coming up to your house? It was so exciting. And of course, there were wealthy women who would order three evening gowns delivered so they could try them on at home and then send them back. There were many Chicagoans who would go on a monthly or even weekly basis to, to shop at Marshall Fields, dress up and go downtown. If you did, you might pick up some chicken pot pie in the restaurant known as the South Grill Room initially, which was a terrible name. They renamed it the Walnut Room. There were actually at 1.7 restaurants in Marshall Fields, the Narcissus Room, the Wedgwood Room, the English Grill, but the uh, Walnut Room was always the most elegant. In 1941, Fields opened the 40, I'm sorry, the 28 shop. This was the boutique for haute couture. Fields had buyers all over Europe, you know, in London and Paris and Rome and Tokyo, and got a lot of imported merchandise. This is where you would go if you wanted to get an original Christian Dior gown or a Balenciaga suit. And you did not just walk in the 28 shop. It had its own entrance at 28 Washington Street. And it gave the whole store this aura of sophistication and high quality to have all these designer goods here. That emphasis on luxury and indulgence gave Marshall Fields a reputation nationwide as one of the top department stores and certainly probably rivaled Wanamaker's for the title of the most prestigious large-scale 
full line department store in the United States. And for Chicagoans, this was a huge point of pride. The store's chocolate mint candies, the Frango mints, became a sort of portable symbol of not just Marshall Fields, but Chicago. Marshall Fields' windows were nationally known as examples of the art of window dressing. They often used the windows to link the store to European ideals in fashions. This is a 1944 window with very um, uh, exquisite imported designs. There was so much concentration of department stores on State Street, window displays became a really important way that stores attracted customer attention and positioned themselves as having unique identities. And of course, what window displays were the most popular of all every year? The Christmas windows. Here's a 1949 image of State Street, the day of the Christmas parade. Santa Claus is right in the middle, but you can barely find him in this photograph. A lot of the stores waited until this parade every year. I think this year it was November 19th before they unveiled their animated Christmas windows. And families from all across the Midwest would descend on Chicago at Christmas time to see the wind. Do you remember going like window store to store to store to see the windows? When the shopping mall boom hit at mid-century, field stores started appearing in shopping malls. Anyone recognize what shopping mall this is? This is Oak Brook Center, which opened in 1962. I believe this is a 1963 image. It's either that or they are having a great car show there that day, right? <laughs> Um, by the way, to give you my street cred, I was a sales associate at this Marshall Fields for one year, but you know, it counts, right? Um, Fields really did not begin to struggle in terms of competition for the same target customer really until the 60s and increasingly the 70s and the 80s. The Loops Grand Dame of Shop, I should have warned you this photo was coming, uh, it ceased to be in September of 2006. That is when the new owner, Federated Department Stores, changed the name and the brand to Macy's. But what is remarkable to me about Marshall Fields is how beloved it still is to this day. These are tourists taking a photo of themselves in front of the Marshall Field and Company sign, which is still on the building. How many other businesses are so beloved that tourists will take a photo of themselves in front of the corporate logo? It's a remarkable legacy. Marshall Fields, more than any other Chicago store, showed a store could transcend its identity as a place to buy stuff. Going to Marshall Fields was an experience. But of course, it was not alone. In fact, if any department store gave Marshall Fields a run for its money, what would you guess? Carson Peary Scott. One writer called it the second store for the second city, which is awful and unfair because many shoppers had charge accounts at both Carson's and Fields. They were fierce competitors and they were also about the same age. Carson's began in 1854. Two Scotch-Irish immigrants, Samuel Carson and John Peary, opened a small dry goods store in a tiny town called Amboy, Illinois. If you don't know Amboy, it is just to the southeast of Dixon. We don't think of Carson's out there because they moved to Chicago at about the time of the Civil War, and they changed the name when Robert Scott came in as a partner in 1890. Carson's was positioned perfectly. It had a reputation for quality, very similar to Marshall Fields, but it also had a great advantage for many, many years, and that was that distinctive building it occupied at State and Madison. Sometimes we even still call it the Carson's building, or is that just me? 
but it was actually not built for Carson Peary Scott. It was built for an earlier dry goods merchant, Schlesinger and Mayer. This is actually the opening day advertisement for the new building of Schlesinger and Mayer. They are the ones who were doing so well at about the turn of the last century that they needed better space, bigger space. So they commissioned Louis Sullivan to design a new store for them. This would be Louis Sullivan's last major commercial design. And he started by putting the entrance at the corner, not at the middle of the block. The corner of State and Madison is where several early plats of Chicago came together. And partly as a result, a lot of Chicago public transportation intersected and crossed at that intersection. In fact, this is an image from State Street looking to the east on Madison. The, you might even be able to see there are streetcar lines that kind of move through that intersection. As you went through that intersection, the entrance to the building kind of moves in a swooping curve the same way the streetcar tracks did. So it was a very prominent way to design the building. He then covered that entrance and a lot of the first floor with that signature Louis Sullivan ornamentation. If you look really, really closely, you can actually see his initials, LHS, uh, in that ironwork. And then he complemented it with that very horizontal look of the the upper floors. It's such a dramatic building that it is probably the most significant retail building in the city of Chicago. Unfortunately, when it opened, Schlesinger and Mayer could not afford to operate there. They sold the building and it eventually ended up in the hands of Carson Peary Scott. Now, to a lot of Chicagoans, the appeal of Carson Peary Scott was it lacked some of the perceived highbrow pretension of Marshall Fields, but still had a great reputation for quality and luxury. You might not guess it, looking at this, this is a three-piece, 100% Orlan polyester suit for $18 from the 60s, but $18 in the early 60s is about the equivalent of 170, 180 uh, in today's money. Not wildly expensive, but that's not a cheap outfit. But whereas Fields always appealed to the high-end or aspiring high-end shopper, Carson specifically targeted the middle class, which was the biggest growing segment of the Chicago population then. And the store had a lot of the same amenities as Marshall Fields, including fashion shows. The model in this photograph is actually walking on top of the merchandise display, um, but at least you can see her, right? And Carson's had a beautiful in-house restaurant called the Heather House with this panoramic mural of Edinburgh, Scotland. When Carson's opened any new store, they used to bring in bagpipers to kind of salute the store's Scotch-Irish roots. There was also a cafeteria in the basement that you re might, might remember called the Tartan Tray. Again, that Scotch-Irish heritage. A lot of Carson's innovations were driven by that ongoing competition with Marshall Fields. Carson's, like Fields, moved very early into the shopping malls. Here is an opening day advertisement for Yorktown Center in suburban Lombard, 1968, which originally featured cars, Carson's, Penny's, Ward's, and Weebolt's, although not all of them were open when the mall opened. Uh, at its height, Carson Perry Scott had 50 branch stores across the Midwest. Marshall Fields at one point had 64 stores, although that included the former Dayton's and Hudson's and stores in Texas and North Carolina and so on. But like Fields, Carson's faced a lot of mounting pressures as outside department stores arrived in the Chicago area. Do you remember when stores like Lord & Taylor arrived in Chicagoland and Neiman Marcus and so on? They're competing for that same target customer. 
Many Chicagoans were heartbroken when Carson Peary Scott was acquired by the Bonton stores, and the Bonton stores closed the State Street store soon after in uh, 2007. The remaining Carson's branches did stay open a while, but even they couldn't buck the tide. In 2018, the Bonton stores filed for bankruptcy, sold off their assets, and closed their doors. This is the closing sale at the Yorktown Carson Peary Scott store. There was one fan who summed it up well. She said, walking into Carson's was like visiting family. F pleasant, familiar, always a warm welcome. It felt like you were visiting family. Marshall Fields and Carson's both began as dry goods stores and expanded into full-line department stores. Some historians would say the very first true department store in Chicago would be the Fair, which opened in 1873. This was the first store in Chicago with a large, a large scale store with multiple departments selling everything for everybody and advertising it all over the building, right? The founder, Ernst Lehman, used a very different approach. From the beginning, he wanted his store to have a diverse inventory. Anytime a rival business closed, he would buy up their leftover merchandise and announce a new department. It was like an ever-changing bazaar. Every time you went there, it would be a different place. It was like a fair. And the prices were really fair. They were good prices. In 1890, the fair announced it was going to build the largest store building in the world, set off a kind of building competition on State Street. This is their massive 12-story building located at State and Adams. When this building opened, not only was it full of shopping areas, it also had a dental parlor, was the first Chicago department store to have food service. They had a pet grooming salon, so you could drop off your dog and then go shopping and pick your dog up when you were done. The fair was very innovative at the beginning, but it was very hesitant to move into branch stores. It did open a few branches, most notably the branch at Randhurst Center, that very innovative shopping mall that opened in Mount Prospect in 1962. But ironically, the fair really was not evolving. By mid-century, it was starting to look for a buyer, someone who might want a great location at State Street and Adams. And the buyer it found was another chain from Chicago by the name of Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward purchased the fair in 1957, and by 65, all fair stores had been converted. Montgomery Ward was new to State Street in 1965, but it was not a new company at all. The company dated back to 1872, that's the year after the Great Chicago Fire, when a guy by the name of, do you want to guess? Aaron Montgomery Ward launched the world's first great mail order company. He had actually been a traveling salesman. Among other companies, he was a salesman for the precursor to Marshall Fields when it was known as Field and Lighter. As he's traveling around, he heard rural uh, town residents complain about their local mom and pop stores had limited selection and high prices. Someone had to cart all the merchandise out to rural areas. Ward realized he could get them bigger selection and much better prices if he sold through the mail. So, his very first catalog, if you can call it that, debuted in 1872. It was a whopping one page. But by 1876, it had 152 pages and got a big boost in sales by becoming the official supply house for the patrons of husbandry, better known as the Grange. During the heyday of mail order at the turn of the last century, Wards was just churning out thick catalogs packed 
packed with merchandise. This is their headquarters building on Michigan Avenue. They actually put it on the cover of one of their catalogs. There was no retail store. It was just mail order. But some people coming to Chicago for the 1893 World's Fair were much more excited to see Montgomery Ward than to go to Marshall Fields. This building was not big enough, so in 1907 they opened a new building on the Chicago River. This was so big that some of the clerks filling orders would go around on roller skates to speed things up. It wasn't until 1926 when Montgomery Ward started opening retail stores, including this one located in Elmhurst, Illinois. This uh, particular store, this photo is from 1966. It was at 161 North York Street. You might not remember it because it was demolished to make room in part for the underpass. The very first Montgomery Ward store, though, was in 1926, and by the 1930s, Wards had more than 500 stores across the nation. Montgomery Ward's growth was very strong through about the middle of the 20th century, and then flattened. Wards went through a series of ownership changes, all trying to bring back the energy, but nothing really revitalized Montgomery Ward. It did hang on a long time, but in 2000, Wards announced it was shutting down permanently, nearly 130 years in business. But what a legacy. Forbes magazine put together a list of the 20 most influential American businessmen of all time, they included Montgomery Ward right up there with Henry Ford and Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan. The only other retail entrepreneur on that list was a guy by the name of Sam Walton. All right, let's talk about another innovator. And this one is not about mail order. It's about discounting. Let's talk about Goldblatt's. Very few stores were as good as Goldblatt's at proving that a neighborhood discount store could be as successful as a high-end downtown retailer. Goldblatt's began with the Goldblatt family. They were immigrants from Poland. The mom and dad opened a grocery store on the very heavily immigrant west side of Chicago. But in 1914, two of the sons, Maurice and Nathan, opened the first Goldblatt's department store on Ashland and Chicago. Here's what their building looked like in the 1920s. It started out as a medium-sized department store to serve the local neighborhood. Budget prices, merchandise that catered to immigrants, and working class shoppers on, on tight budgets. It boomed. Within 10 years, Goldblatt's annual sales went from $15,000 to $1.4 million. This is a later image, but it captures that kind of bustling excitement that Goldblatt's was known for. Merchandise would be piled in. There were no frills. There's no Tiffany mosaic at Goldblatt's store, right? Louis Goldblatt, eventually all the Goldblatt brothers were involved. He said, Goldblatt's was a beehive of excitement and fun. It was not intended to be fancy or even comfortable. <laughs> and Goldblatt's pioneered a lot of innovative buying techniques, they would buy up factory seconds or leftovers from last season or it would make huge bulk purchases to get really great prices. And they would do these zany promotions. One time they got a great deal on men's shirts, so they piled these boxes of shirts on a table and announced, Men's shirts, special deal, one dollar each. And customers just poured to the table. And some of the boxes fell on the floor. So Louis Goldblatt went over, picked them up, refolded them and put them in boxes, went up on a ladder and started throwing them down saying, new, uh, new delivery, one dollar, any shirt you want, slightly damaged, but one dollar each. And as a store with bargain prices, Goldblatt's was 
very successful during the Great Depression. They actually bought several smaller local department stores and expanded, and they even opened their very first Goldblatt store on State Street. They moved into this building. If you have very good eyesight, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, this building was not built for Goldblatt's. It was built for an earlier department store called Rothschild's back in 1912. This is a gorgeous building. It's 12 stories, terracotta. I love those arches on the first two floors. Between each archway, and you really can't see it, but there are little terracotta circles that have the letter R in them. That is for Rothschilds. Rothschilds eventually did close and Goldblatt's moved into it. There, can you see the R's in the um, facade of the building, even though you might be able to see the awnings read Goldblatt's, but there are the, um, the R's. This was the Great Depression, but Goldblatt's had great prices and even middle class shoppers are looking for good bargains. The State Street Store had a lot larger selection of merchandise than the neighborhood Goldblatt stores did, but still included the same kind of zany promotions. This is a woman riding a bull down the center of State Street to advertise an upcoming food sale. Anyone recognize the guy with the accordion back there? Do you see him? That is Lawrence Welk. He was living in River Forest at the time. And of course, Goldblatt's was very price competitive compared to Fields and Carson's. Their slogan was the incredible bargain centers. Goldblatt's operations probably peaked in the 1970s when they had 47 stores, including this one located in Addison, Illinois. But Goldblatt's got hit harder than any other Chicago department store with the arrival of the national discount chains. That really began in the watershed year of 1962. That's when Kmart began and Target and Walmart. Very quickly, there were other chains opening up competing for that same Target customer. Here is EJ Corvettes. Remember this one on St. Charles Road and 83? Corvettes, along with Zare and Venture and Turnstile, cut very heavily into Goldblatt's revenues because they had been serving that market for so many decades. By the 1970s and 80s, Goldblatt's was really known more for its shortcomings than for its earlier innovations. They declared bankruptcy in 1981 and in 2003, with only six stores left, Goldblatt's liquidated. But Goldblatt's earned very strong customer loyalty. Their stores were often very easy to access. They were right in your neighborhood. And people reminisce about things. Uh, there was one woman who said, we used to go to Goldblatt's after church on Sunday, and they had delis selling sausages. She said, whenever I smell Polish sausage, I think, oh, it smells like Goldblatt's. Um, and there was another customer who said, my mom used to purchase her pet birds there. I remember her getting six finches for about $2 each, guaranteed to sing. <laughs> But the thing about neighborhood stores, once we start looking at neighborhood, local kinds of department stores, you really start to see the history of department stores encompasses hundreds of stores. Because there was a time when nearly every Chicago neighborhood and nearly every small town or suburb had its own mom and pop department store. One of the very biggest was Gately's People's Store. This was located in the Roseland neighborhood of Chicago. It was huge. They sold everything, you know, coats, groceries, lingerie, shoes, pets, hardware, furs, the uniforms for any local neighborhood school, right? Sometimes um, Catholic school uniforms or gym uniforms. It had a barber shop and a beauty salon and a cafeteria where you could get a full meatloaf meal for $1. 
Your grandfather worked there. Fantastic. Uh, I've got a, um, I found a beautiful women's red wool coat from Gately's in great shape. And it's, uh, it's actually in the exhibit. So there you go. Elmhurst had three community department stores. Anyone remember their names? Ruby's? Olswang's? The Elm Department Store, you got it. The oldest or very, the first one to open was Olswang's. Olswang's began in 1915 as a small dry goods store, just two clerks. It eventually expanded what we're looking here is Park Avenue and York Street, right? Um, by the 1940s, Olswang's called itself DuPage County's largest department store. You can tell that is pre-shopping mall, right? It had 60 staff members and one of the most complete shoe departments in the area. The Elm was opened by an Elmhurst businessman named Harry Cohen in 1932 as a women's and children's store. It was originally just one storefront, but it expanded big time over the years. This is uh, First Street that we're looking at here in 1945. One of the distinctive advantages of local stores was you could park right out in front. And later on, the Elm actually built a parking area behind the store store with a separate rear entrance was one of the advantages that local stores had over the shopping mall stores. You know, you have to park a mile away and then walk all the way to the store. Department stores were very local. And Ruby's, this was the third to open, a guy named Irvin Ruby opened it. He'd actually been a partner in Old Swings, but he and the owner had a, a bit of a tiff. So he opened his own store in 1946, 149 North York Street. Again, women's and children's clothing initially, but very quickly expanded. Business was so strong at Ruby's, they remodeled and expanded three times in the 50s through the 60s. And Ruby's advantages for a long time focused on customer service, things like free gift wrapping, delivery, and they knew local customers. You could go downtown to State Street and they're going to have merchandise keyed for any Chicago area resident. Local department stores like Ruby's had clerks who knew local trends and oftentimes knew their customers by name, right? A lot of these stores often had uh, the same customers for years. But local department is an interior image of old swangs. Local department stores really started to struggle almost immediately with the arrival of the shopping malls. And a lot of the problem also was transportation. The more automobile transportation you've got, the less foot traffic you've got in downtown areas. Old Swings closed in the 1960s. The Elm closed in 1986. Ruby's held on the longest. They very wisely pivoted to specialize in children's um, clothing and eventually children's um, everything. But ultimately, even Ruby's closed in 1999. So let's talk about another neighborhood store in Chicago, and that was Weebolt's. Weebolt's began 1883, a German immigrant, William Weebolt. He opened this store on Milwaukee near Ashland, a very densely populated blue collar neighborhood. It was on the, it's on the Northwest side. And like Goldblatt's, did very, very well serving local shoppers with local targeted merchandise. And Weebolt's vision from the start, he wanted to be a local store. Weebolt had a multilingual staff, and they even advertised in foreign languages to reach those immigrants living in the immediate neighborhood. So you've got great prices, convenient location, and clerks who can converse with you. And you'll see this a lot. Uh, St. Charles had um, Colson's department store, which had clerks who could speak Swedish because so many locals uh, only spoke Swedish. By 1930, there were five Weebolt stores. This is, I believe, the back of the yards neighborhood store. Although 
unlike Goldblatt's, Weebolt's did aim for some of the elegance, some of that customer service of the big downtown stores. They had decorations at Christmas time and often window displays and uh, even snack shops. But Weebolt's identity was it was a local neighborhood store. So many were surprised in 1960 when Weebolt's announced it was taking over Mandel Brothers. Anyone remember Mandel Brothers? Mandel Brothers is not well remembered, but at one point it was one of the biggest department stores on State Street. It was located, what we're looking at here is the intersection of State and Madison. Let's see if I can get my directions right. It is the north east corner of State and Madison. Here is Marshall Fields. If we continued over to the right, we would hit Carson Peary Scott. Mandel Brothers was around for decades. Mandel Brothers really went into decline because it just refused to expand much beyond State Street, and that was the death knell. They were already in the red and looking for a buyer by the mid-1950s. And the buyer that it found was Weebolts. So Weebolts got its first State Street presence in 1960 at State and Madison. I mean, what could be better? Unfortunately, though, the whole State Street model by 1960 was very outdated. These very vertical stores with tons of space, a lot of it um, necessary in the early days, but outdated by 1960. But Weebolts had one big advantage for many, many years, and that was it was a center for s and Green Stamps Redemption. Do you remember s and Green Stamps? If you, never, if you never experienced them, these were customer loyalty stamps. You would get them at grocery stores or gas stations, and you'd lick them and put them into a book. The books always got really thick, and they were always wavy from the water. Remember those? But you could bring them in to an s and Green Stamp Redemption Center and get free merchandise. Many, many customers of Weebolt's were loyal because Weebolt stores all had s and Green Stamps redemption centers, and the biggest one was at the State Street store. I can remember my parents saved up Green Stamps, and we got a new ironing board. It was so exciting, right? I mean, felt like it was free. Weebolts, as a store that began with local neighborhood locations, was very easy in moving into shopping centers and regional branches. Um, this is an opening uh, era advertisement for the new Weebolts store at Yorktown. How about those fantastic fashions for fall, right? Aren't they good? Uh, you better believe they had bell-bottom pants at Weebolts in the, in the 70s. Weebolt's popularity rested on its reputation as a store that was much more affordable than Marshall Fields or Carson's, but more upscale than the real bargain um, discount stores. During the 70s, Weebolt still employed about 6,000 people in the Chicago area. But Weebolt's particular pressures came from the decline of the middle class. Increasingly, shopping started to bifurcate into luxury, high-end, boutique, and specialty stores and discount chains. Increasingly, even middle class shoppers were looking at the discount stores for great bargains. In 1986, Weebolts was forced into bankruptcy and never recovered. By the end of 1987, all Weebolts stores had closed, including the flagship on state. All right, I have one department store chain left to talk about. Anyone know which one it is? Sears, which might have been the biggest business ever to come out of Chicago. Sears did not begin in Chicago. It began in Minnesota, and it did not begin with dry goods. It began with a shipment of watches that a guy by the name of Richard Sears received in 1886. He started selling watches as a side business. He needed a watch repairman, so he found a guy named Alva Roebuck, 
they eventually did sell jewelry and they did have a catalog, but the Sears real boom began when Richard Sears moved to Chicago in 1892 and launched a mail order catalog called the Sears Catalog. Now, like Montgomery Wards, this was a cornucopia of merchandise. You could buy anything from a corset to, you know, a house, right? Between 1907 and the early 1940s, you could buy a kit home, and they would deliver everything, the plans, the wood, the nails, the paint, the kitchen sink, everything. Sears homes today are very treasured, and there are a number of them in Elmhurst. A lot of the models, by the way, for the Sears homes were given names after Chicago towns. There's a model called the Barrington, and there is indeed a model called the Elmhurst. And you can see a photo of a version of the Elmhurst that is in Elmhurst. How about that? But the benefit that Sears had was that Sears wrote the text himself, and he had this flair for exciting uh, descriptions. I mean, this is the easiest running washing machine on the market. A child can run it. But he also stood behind his merchandise. Like Montgomery Ward, it was a money-back guarantee. A lot of people nervous about mail order. That money-back guarantee was critical. And what got Sears explosively popular was the arrival of parcel post delivery in 1913. Prior to that, the post office would only deliver a package if it was four pounds or less. There were times when, I think it was wards, if you ordered a heavy overcoat, they would cut it in half and send it to you in two packages with a needle and thread so you could sew it up. So uh, parcel post was a big, big improvement. In 1913, Sears sales increased fivefold thanks to that. By 1904, Sears needed so much space, it built a new 40 acre complex on Homan Avenue on the west side of Chicago. It had a printing building, it had its own power plant, and the very first Sears Tower which, by the way, is still there if you, most of the complex is gone today. Again, it was a big surprise in 1925 when the company announced it was opening a retail store. This was the brilliance of the new president, Julius Rosenwald. He realized automobiles were changing everything about retail. If you were a rural customer and you suddenly had an automobile, it's a lot easier to get into town to shop rather than shop by mail order. So Sears decided they wanted to be there first. The very first Sears store was in that complex headquarters in Chicago. That was 1925. Within 10 years, Sears had nearly 400 stores, including one in Elmhurst. This is 170 North York Street, which opened in 1927. It closed about 1964. There was one year in the 1920s when Sears was opening, on average, one store every other business day. It was uncanny. 1931 is when Sears retail sales passed catalog sales for the first time. Sears made another leap in 1932. They opened their first downtown Chicago, I mean downtown store. This is in Chicago uh, at Congress, uh, between Congress and Van Buren. The building, by the way, is architecturally very significant. It had been put up for Siegel Cooper Department Store, one of the first commercial buildings with a steel frame skeleton. Really important for um, future development of skyscrapers. Again though, for Sears, opening up this building was perfect. The Great Depression is forcing a lot of customers to look for good bargains. On opening day, 150 thousand shoppers came to the Sears on State Street. Sears had this uncanny ability to anticipate changes in consumer behavior. When customers started showing a preference for brands, 
Sears acquired Craftsman Tools, that was 1927, same year that Sears acquired Kenmore Appliances, later joined by Allstate Insurance, and does anyone remember Tough Skins Kids Clothes? Remember those clothes that would never, ever wear out? They were, <laughs> they were crazy. And what fascinates me, Sears retail stores did not cut into catalog sales. The catalog continued to grow, regularly reaching 1,000, 1,200 pages. If you were like my family, you'd use the Sears catalog as like booster seats at Thanksgiving. Anyone remember what a lot of people out in rural areas used to do with the old Sears catalog when a new one arrived? Bring it to the outhouse. Um, for toilet paper. A lot of customers were really mad when Sears switched to shiny four-color photographs. <laughs> you couldn't use it for that anymore. When shopping malls emerged, Sears became a flagship anchor in malls across the nation. Anyone recognize where this Sears store was? It says Oak Brook Center in the very, very early days when SS Kresge was located adjacent to it. Sears by the 70s was just a behemoth. It was said that one out of three American workers had a Sears credit card. It only seemed appropriate that in 1973, Sears would move its headquarters to the world's tallest building, this building we all still call the Sears Tower. You got it. It's really Willis Tower today, right? Time Magazine said, the most intriguing thing about Sears is so many Americans buy so many things there. And yet, and yet over time, they just didn't. Sears executives seem to really dig in, doing things the way they always had. They refused to update the displays and the interior decor in the 60s. They stubbornly stuck to their in-house credit card only policy, although they did uh, start Discover, right? And competition is growing from discount retailers, big box stores. Sears heavily invested in shopping mall real estate. Sears was forced to start making changes, and it did have some successes. Do you remember the softer side of Sears ad campaign, which was really successful? but didn't gain substantial traction. It's one of the great ironies of history that this company, which had been so good at predicting shifts in shopping behavior, was languishing by the 80s. It was 1991 when Walmart passed Sears to be the biggest US retailers. In 1993, Sears stopped its catalog Awful timing because online shopping was just taking hold. Sears did have an online shopping website, but it was never a major player. Sears was able to keep making money through 2010, but after that, the red ink just could not be stopped. Sears started closing store after store, laying off workers, and in 2018, declared bankruptcy. They did come back but stores are continuing to close. The very last Sears store in the state of Illinois was the Sears store at Woodfield Mall, which closed in 2021. But whenever I bring up Sears, someone invariably will bring up the candy and nut counter and how that smell would permeate the sales floor. You'd smell that. And kids would beg their parents, let's go to Sears so you could get you know, the popcorn at that um, uh, uh, counter. People remember the wonderful credit policy that they had. People have deep nostalgic memories about Sears. One man whose father gave him a reverence for Craftsman Tools, he said, if your socket wrench broke, you just brought it to Sears and they'd give you a replacement, no questions asked. There are people in the Chicago area who said everything in their house came from Sears. So where are we today? Of those seven department stores on State Street in 1947, all of them are gone. Usually the State Street store closed first and then they disappeared forever, swallowed up by competitors or driven into bankruptcy. 
We still shop today, but shopping is much more diversified geographically and literally. But surprisingly, if you walk around communities today, a lot of the buildings are still there. The former Goldblatt store on State Street is now part of DePaul University. Those R's are still there in that building. The old Carson Peary Scott building is still there. It is now known as the Sullivan Center. There's a target on the bottom floor of it. Closer to home, ooh, wait. the old Weebolt store at Yorktown Center is now Von Mar, same building, just um, very heavily renovated. Even the Old Swang's department store building is still there. It is now operating as 100 South Chops, Chop House, if you ever go there. Um, you might still smell the merchandise in the air. <laughs> we still even have one State Street department store that's operating as a department store, and that's the old Marshall Fields. It is today known as Macy's on State Street. But even more than that, we have this legacy. Chicago really led the way in the rise of the modern department store. As Chicago's population grew and competition was fierce, department stores in this area pioneered a lot of things. Everything from pampering customer services to innovations in window design, mail order, discount shopping, a lot of it even if it wasn't invented in Chicago, was in many ways pioneered and perfected in Chicago. When we think about shopping as a pleasant leisure time activity, a lot of what we're remembering are the things that these great department stores pioneered. All right, I will finish up with that. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks. Thanks. Um, now, I know we've been sitting a while, so if anyone needs to stretch your legs or if you need to get going, please feel free. But I am happy to open up the floor for questions, if anybody has any. Anything um, that I can tell you? We've got folks with microphones who can come around and um, answer it. Um, here, while you're coming around, let me take a question here and I'll repeat it. The library is doing a talk on Sears Houses tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in person and on Zoom. So um, if you're interested in Sears Houses, it's worth it. They're fantastic. So OK, go ahead. When I was a kid, there was a train in the walls only kids could ride in one of the stores downtown. Do you remember anything? Oh about that? yes, you're probably if you're like the, if if you're like most people, if you remember a store that had a toy department with a train, you're probably remembering the Sears store on State Street. They had, if you never saw it, it was really cool. It was uh, hanging. It was like a monorail that you could get on, and kids could ride around it. There was also a train at the fair. But that was, uh, you're all, we're all too young to remember that one. So, yeah. I just had a quick question about uh, Bonwit Teller and I Magnin. Oh, Can yeah. Input on those two? I didn't mention Bonwit Teller or I Magnin, mostly um, just because they weren't Chicago born companies. Um, the focus, but, but you know, it's, imp it's an important part of the story. I mean, Bonwit Teller. I want to say it was 1973 when the first Bonwit Teller stores started opening up in the Chicago area. God, I loved that store. That's where I went, you know, you need a school dress, you know, like a, a dance dress. Um, iMagnon was a little bit later in the Chicago area, maybe in the late 70s, early 80s. But I think it's significant because the Chicago market was so desirable that a lot of department stores that originated in other places of the country started moving. In. And of course, I can't remember where Bonwit Teller began. I want to say it was New York, but I could be wrong on that. Um, I, Neiman Marcus was Texas. I Magnum, was that San Francisco? I thought it was California. Yeah. So, all right. Um, there's a couple up here. I'll repeat it, but there's another one up here. Yeah. What about Charles A. Stevens? Oh gosh, I would love to mention Charles A. Stevens. The only reason I didn't mention Charles A. Stevens is because I, for time purposes, I wanted to focus just on the full line department stores. 
But it's a really good thing to mention because Charles A. Stevens, if you never went there, was an incredible, big, multi-department fashion store. It focused, but it wasn't just fashion. I mean, it was clothing, but also shoes. And a real expert. They, they were one of the first Chicago stores to have a junior's department, which sold mini skirts in the 1960s. Um, I didn't mention it just because it was own, you know, it wasn't full lot. You couldn't go to Charles A. Stevens and buy a refrigerator. Um, same thing with, I don't know if anyone remembers Litton's or Maurice Rothschild. I mean, these are all great stores. Or even a big multi-department company like Polk Brothers. Remember Polk Brothers? With the, they sold appliances and electronics and they had great promotions. Do you remember those big Santa blow molds? And Santas, yes. They would give out things like with any purchase in December you could get this giant blow mold Santa for five dollars. And like everybody had them. And now they're really collectible and very expensive. So if you have one, don't break it. <laughs> they're treasured. They would do promotions like give away a Coke with every order and have a Coke on poke, things like that. So, um, do I remember Madigan's? I do remember Madigan's. That's another one. Uh, was, was there, there was a Madigan's at Yorktown, wasn't there? Yeah. I, when I was doing some research for this exhibit, I was actually trying to ask locals about their memories of these stores. And this one girl, oh God, what, what was it she bought at Madigan's? I want to say it was like her first pair of designer jeans. It was something like that. And she made a special trip to Madigan's because they had the best stuff. Isn't that funny? Sometimes with department stores, I don't even remember what I bought. I remember the going to the department store, but if it's a really cool thing, you know. I had someone today telling me, just this morning, she was talking about going to um, Lord and Taylor, and she got a dress for a big fancy event that her father was sponsoring. And they went downtown and they changed into their fancy clothes and then they changed out at the end, and she left it there. And to this day, she is so mad that she lost her Lord and Taylor dress. Um, but it's telling, isn't it? Because a lot of these stores, it was it was special. When maybe not, you know, Goldblatt's, but you know, someone said you knew you'd made it in Chicago when you bought your first item for full price at Marshall Fields. You know, <laughs> like not the budget floor, full price, right? So, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'll repeat it. Yeah. Okay, this is my mom, and she and my dad both grew up here in town, and they remember as children, Roy Rogers was supposed to come meet the kids behind Old Flag, and they were both bitterly disappointed. Is this still true? Is this true? I don't know. Roy Rogers was supposed to make an appearance behind Old Swang and never showed up? That's terrible. That's awful. Anyone else remember this happening? Do you remember it? She saw Hopalong Cassidy with his horse across the street from, from which one? From which Goldblatt's? The one on Matt. Oh, so the, yeah. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I grew up in the art community in Chicago, and we had a burglar. Ah. Chicago Airport. Yeah. And they were going to Yes. She, she was saying she, she grew up in the Austin neighborhood and remembers a Bergner's store. Yes, Bergner's was not a Chicago-born store, but it did move into the Chicago area. They were ultimately acquired by uh, the Bonton, which also acquired Carson Peary Scott. And in fact, there's a sort of, it was like a red rosette, like red... Um, you know, if you remember, like, that was the logo for Carson Peary Scott. It was also the same logo used by Bergner's, which is why you can sometimes wonder what's going on with all of this. It was the same thing, yeah. Do you remember that uh, Carson Peary Scott had those white boxes with the red rosette? Those, um, at one point, it had other boxes. Which one? Oh, yeah, in the back here. 
Oh, oh, wait, there's two of you right there. They'll do one and then the other. Ah. Okay. Ah. Yes. Oh, I know where you're going. Yeah. Yes. The Sears would be on top. Yes. Yes. Uh, if, if anyone didn't hear that, um, this is true. Now, it's not true throughout the entire history of Sears and Montgomery Wards, but yes, there was a point when Sears decided to make its catalogs slightly smaller than the Montgomery Ward catalogs because they knew that women would stack, or anyone, would stack them up next to the telephone. You know, this was the days before you could order online. So people would often make their orders by phone. And if you're stacking something, you usually put the smaller one on top. And they wanted that Sears catalog on top. So it'd be the first one you'd reach for. You know, it's not true by the time you get to the 60s and the 70s. They're pretty much the same size. But it is absolutely true that for a while, that's what Sears did. By the way, that reminds me, Chicago Stories, you know that WTTW series? They've got a new season this year, and one of them coming up is going to be on that rivalry between Sears and Montgomery Ward. So worth checking out. And, and it's fantastic because it's not a coincidence that they were both Chicago-based company and their competition led to a lot of great innovations. Okay, let's take one more question. And the, in the white, yeah. Her mother managed the beauty shop at EJ Corvette, if anyone uh, ever went. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, she's remembering there is a long-standing legend that E.J. Corvettes stood for eight Jewish Korean War veterans, right? It's a great story, right? The company was founded in 1948 as before the Korean War, and uh, you know, certainly before American involvement. However, it is true, the founders, they were two guys named Eugene and Joe, and they were, in fact, Jewish. So that part, at least, is, is true. And does anyone remember uh, the Cinnamon Bear? The Cinnamon Bear was a, a radio show. It actually didn't originate in Chicago. It originated in Seattle, but Weebolt's department store purchased the rights to, to air on the radio, the cinema. It was like a daily radio show in the days leading up to Christmas, and there was this cinnamon bear who would follow, um, you know, would, would be um, helping some kids find the Silver Star. I didn't even get into Christmas, but Christmas characters, there are a lot of them from the Chicago region, most notably at Marshall Field and Company, Uncle Mistletoe, who eventually, be, you know, had spun off into Mistletoe Bear, and at Montgomery Ward and Company, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, all of them from Chicago. There are a lot of great, great stories. So again, I hope everyone will have a chance to check out the museum exhibit. It's up through the end of January, January 28th, and the stories that it will probably inspire. We, can, we didn't talk about Christmas boxes, gift boxes, credit cards, all kinds of great stories over there. So I hope you'll have a chance to check it out. Thank you all so much for coming.